My name is David Lepofsky. I'm the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. The Ontario government spent almost a billion dollars on a huge new Toronto courthouse without ensuring that it is fully accessible to people with disabilities. Let me show you a billion dollar accessibility bungle. The new downtown Toronto Armory Street Courthouse. The courthouse has some good features. Courtrooms have power doors, good acoustics, and space for turning wheelchairs. But important accessibility features are missing or botched. This is despite our warnings about serious accessibility problems for years before the court was built. Jamming six criminal courthouses from all over Toronto into one huge downtown Toronto mega courthouse creates new disability barriers. People must travel much further through traffic just to get to court. A longer trip to court saps energy needed for a long day in court from people with chronic fatigue or pain. There's far too little disability parking for the public coming to this court. There's none for the public on the court property and only six street disability parking spots near the court. Any downtown shoppers with disability permits can snatch those spots. Nothing ensures that there is an accessible route from expensive downtown parking lots to this court. Schlepping from those lots can exhaust people with fatiguing conditions. There's no guarantee that the route to court from nearby subway stations is unobstructed. It's too hard for us blind people to find the courthouse front door because they built this building too far back from the street. There are cane-detectable wayfinding tiles on the ground to guide blind people through the huge, unnecessary public square in front of the building to the front door. But these small metal tiles are terrible. Using my white cane, it's hard to find where they start and to follow them. If somebody hadn't told me about them, I wouldn't know what they're for. Gaps between some tiles make me wrongly think I'm at a dead end. The tiles direct me on a bizarre route. They direct me into big security bollards. They should have built a straight, clearly defined sidewalk from the curb to the front door with cane detectable edges. Outside, they created a service animal relief area. There's a ridiculous, complicated path of those awful metal tiles to get to it. Speeding up the video, I exit the building, walk forward, and must turn right. Then I walk a few meters, turn left, walk a few more meters, turn right, and walk a few more meters. I missed turns. How am I supposed to find the relief area's braille sign? This tactile path is useless for blind people using a guide dog. They won't feel turn points through their shoes. The relief area should be located a few meters right in front of the exit, so it's easy to find. Also, the relief area is dirt, not grass. Some service dogs won't go there. Some people with disabilities come to court on paratransit, wheel trans. There's a designated wheel trans drop-off spot on Center Street. However, anyone can park there. When we filmed, this block was parked up. It is good that so many doors in this building have power door operators. Yet for some, the button is positioned so that the door swings open and hits you, like this front door did. By May 2024, they fixed this problem. Now, when you push the button beside the left door, only the opposite right door opens. The main floor help desk is hard to find. You have to pass through security and turn left away from the regular path of travel. When I first enter the building, there's no Walmart reader to ask for help. I want to avoid bothering the police. They are well back from the door, screening for security dangers. The help desk has no knee space to accommodate a person in a wheelchair. The government violated its own mandatory accessibility regulations in this new court of law. So much for the government's boasts that they are leading Ontario by example on accessibility. The government designated at least one official at each court facility in Ontario as a disability accessibility coordinator. Several are in this building. Two are always on duty at the main floor help desk. A great idea, but how do people know about them? In July of 2023, there was some signage about them on the main floor, but none on other floors with courtrooms. Signage in front of courtrooms, like Courtroom 101, talks about courtroom decorum, but not about finding accessibility help. It is good that this sign has braille and raised lettering by the print. 
but the Braille only says 101 courtroom. It leaves out the sign's printed information about court decorum. This courthouse has an unnecessary multi-floor atrium with huge windows to the outside. Indoor bright light and glare creates problems for some people with low vision or autism. The government said blinds would prevent glare. They didn't prevent it on the main floor before entering the atrium. The shiny white main floor makes this worse. Atriums cause bad acoustics, a problem for those with vision loss, autism, or who are hard of hearing. Waiting for an elevator on the ground floor? You have to strain to hear an elevator beep. Bad acoustics make this harder. Making it worse, the two sets of three public elevators face each other. Facing one set, the other set is behind you. That's worse for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. The fourth floor has floor-to-ceiling glass, preventing someone from falling to their death. The third floor only has a railing with open air above. This isn't clever in a criminal court where there are people with anger issues. We told the government not to include an atrium. An architect responded that an atrium conveys the justice system's grandeur. I doubt that on trial day, this atrium makes witnesses or the accused contemplate the justice system's grandeur. The main floor has a large and totally unnecessary feature staircase. People lugging trial bags won't want to haul them upstairs. They'll use escalators or elevators. The government mandated that stairs here must not have open risers. You can catch your foot in an open riser and trip. Yet it selected a building design with open risers. We objected. They reluctantly agreed to closed risers. So why does this bottom step on the ground floor have an open riser? It is good that the elevators have braille and raised print letters by the elevator buttons. But sometimes the braille number is not lined up on the same level as the corresponding button. The ground floor is labeled in print as ground. But the braille says D. What does D mean? An electronic voice announces the floor when you arrive. However, here it's too quiet. You can barely hear it say second floor and then ground. If the elevator gets stuck, there's two-way emergency communication with security. There's a hearing induction loop for people who are hard of hearing and who use certain hearing aids, but nothing for deaf people. They need a way to communicate by text. I hope they don't get stuck between angry members of rival gangs. Blind people need tactile wayfinding to navigate large open spaces inside a building. There are some tactile wayfinding guides on the floor in parts of this building. However, some open spaces lack needed wayfinding. There is none to guide you to the main floor's only courtroom. The main floor has none from the elevator to the building's exit. When you leave the elevator on the sixth floor, there's a tactile wayfinding path. Turn one way, it leads to a hall with courtrooms. That wayfinding path suddenly stops in a wide open area. That's where I need wayfinding the most. Leaving that elevator and turning the other way, that wayfinding path leads me to collide with an accessible electronic kiosk at waist height. Ouch! They put a weird wayfinding path cutting across a hallway from a courtroom door on one side to a blank wall on the other. A path to nowhere. I've been told this is to let me know I've reached a courtroom. I'd never have understood that from this floor marking. Outside this courtroom, the tactile warning isn't color contrasted with the floor. People with low vision need color contrasting, as do sighted people who don't want to trip. I asked a building designer why there's no color contrasting. Answer, it was a design decision. That treats aesthetics as far more important than accessibility. Moreover, some other indoor wayfinding paths do have color contrast. This building has too few accessible public washrooms. Accessible washrooms and universal washrooms both accommodate people using wheelchairs. Both can have a baby change table. The difference is that a universal washroom has an adult change table. Good luck figuring out where there are disability washrooms. Each floor with courtrooms has one public women's washroom. Some floors have one public men's washroom. None of those washrooms have any accessible stalls. Each floor also has an accessible, public, all genders, single-use washroom. Anyone can use them, even if they have no disability. Only a minority of floors have a universal washroom. The first, third, fourth, seventh, 
10th, 13th, and 16th. All should. It's hard to find the ground floor washrooms. No tactile wayfinding leads to them. They're hidden on a corridor off the main floor. That corridor is behind this door, which has no braille signage. The main floor universal washroom has buttons to open, close, and lock the door. These have no braille. The tap has no motion sensor, a feature which some people with disabilities need to turn on the water. If you are blind, don't trust this building's public washroom braille signage. The sixth floor public women's washroom print sign says it's a women's washroom. The braille sign incorrectly says universal women, yet it's not universal or even accessible. A second washroom's print sign correctly says all genders accessible, but the braille doesn't say that it is accessible, only that it is all gender. The third washroom's print sign says it's a men's washroom. The braille says it's a universal men's washroom, yet it's neither universal nor accessible. In the third floor court services office, you must take a number from an electronic kiosk and wait your turn to speak to staff at one of the eight counters. Only two of the counters are at an accessible height. All eight should be. That kiosk's touchscreen is inaccessible to blind and dyslexic people, violating accessibility regulations. The kiosk produces a number in print, which is also inaccessible to blind and dyslexic people. It's your turn when your number comes up on a monitor. That's also inaccessible to them. There's a plexiglass barrier from the counter on up. A few holes are cut out to speak through. This creates communication barriers for people who are hard of hearing. The plexiglass is supposed to prevent people from lunging over the counter at staff. Why not just install bars? Now, there's an assisted hearing loop for people using certain kinds of hearing aids, but only at two of the eight counters. There's a Wheeltrans waiting area inside on the main floor, but it has no line of sight to the Wheeltrans parking spot. Wheeltrans riders can't afford to miss their ride. The driver only waits a short while. There's a video monitor in the waiting area. It's supposed to show the Wheeltrans parking spot. There are three problems. First, that's useless to blind passengers. Second, when we shot this video, the monitor was black. Third, if other cars are parked there and the Wheeltrans vehicle parked somewhere else, the camera won't show it waiting. In order not to miss their ride, people with disabilities might opt to wait outside. The weather might be raining, boiling hot, or freezing. There's no security there protecting vulnerable crime victims and witnesses. Who made all these poor design decisions ignoring accessibility advice? After the building opened, the government hired more accessibility consultants to try to fix some of this mess. The government got the Rick Hansen Foundation to provide a private accessibility certification of this building. That's a waste of public money. We've exposed huge problems with Hansen's program. Take this building. It's hard to find the front door and difficult to navigate in parts of it. It has inaccurate and incomplete braille signage, an inaccessible main floor help desk, and court services electronic kiosk, far too little accessible parking, a Wheeltrans waiting area that lacks line of sight to the Wheeltrans parking spot, and no assurance that Wheeltrans can always park there. And there are even more accessibility problems with this courthouse that we couldn't cram into this video or the longer version of it. Despite all that, the Hansen Foundation awarded this courthouse a gold accessibility rating according to the government. You can't trust or rely on a Hansen Foundation certification of accessibility. It certifies nothing. The government must revamp how it spends infrastructure dollars. We need strong, mandatory, comprehensive, enforced built environment accessibility standards. The building code and accessibility standards under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act are grossly inadequate. We must at long last require design professionals like architects to be trained on how to design accessible buildings. For more details, search on New Toronto Courthouse Billion Dollar Accessibility Bungle Long Version. Learn more at www.aodaalliance.org.